an experienced eye can spot the subtle signs of a young nest. Founded perhaps six months ago, when a new queen left home with a bit of fungus in her mouth and burrowed into the ground. Mm, there, it there it is. Beautiful. Opening a nest is a very exciting moment. Suddenly the cavity opens and you see the fungus garden. And then you may see the queen. There's the queen. Yeah. There she is. Mm. The size of a peanut. What we've learned from studying the ants is that you can have a long-term existence over 50 million years as an agriculturist. There's clear parallels between the ant agriculture and the human agriculture. Both types of societies are dependent on cultivation of some other organism and have very sophisticated procedures how to promote the growth of these organisms. But human farmers are plagued by pests in their crops while the ants' garden seemed pest-free. A century of research had concluded that the ants are probably so adept at weeding that no infestation can take hold. A graduate student in 1998, Cameron Curry just didn't buy it. I actually had uh, some people tell me that uh, looking at diseases in the ant gardens was, was kind of a, a silly project, that the ants maintain their gardens free of diseases. And so why would you be going there to look for diseases? So I went out and collected ant colonies and, and I isolated pieces of the garden uh, to see what was there other than the fungus the ants cultivated. He cultured 1,500 fungus samples and the same aggressive mold kept showing up. When he removed the ants from a nest, he saw the mold devastate the fungus in a matter of days. So the ants did have a pest in their gardens. But how did they keep it so completely under control? Cameron began to wonder about a white, waxy coating on the body parts of some ants. What really intrigued him were the ants working deep in the gardens that were covered with the stuff. He asked the experts about it. In the past, people had just considered this to be some sort of nondescript secretion that was produced by the ants for unknown, probably uninteresting reasons. And Cameron was the first to put this waxy secretion on the, under the microscope and notice it was not inert and lifeless, but it was actually alive. The wax turned out to be tangled mats of bacteria. But what shocked Cameron was these were the same types of bacteria that produce half the antibiotics used in human medicine. I remember my graduate advisor and I were laughing, thinking that um, wouldn't this be exciting if these ants have been effectively using these bacteria for production of antibiotics for millions of years, when humans only discovered this 60 years ago. And, and uh, we thought at the time that this was maybe a bit far-fetched. Far-fetched, but true. It seems the ants have been using antibiotics to control the pest in their gardens for some 50 million years. So why hasn't the mold evolved antibiotic resistance? I think that the answer probably lies in the fact that the ants are using cultures of millions of cells of bacteria to produce these antibiotics. And so these bacteria are evolving. Likewise, the uh, pathogen that is the target of these antibiotics is also evolving. And it's an evolutionary arms race that has continued for 50 million years. And so the symbiosis of ant and fungus also includes the aggressive mold in the fungus garden and the bacteria living on the ants. Nature is often more complex than it first appears. Scientists have just begun to understand how two species can interact, or three or four, but they're a long way from understanding how thousands or tens of thousands of species can interact to create the monumental ecosystems of the world like rainforest and coral reefs. And the most remarkable gap in our knowledge is in bacteria and other microorganisms. 
because these make up the base of the living world. We need them, they don't need us. And yet, we do everything in our power to avoid microbes. A barrage of new products states the message loud and clear. The only good germ is a dead one. Are we making our world too clean? Consider the research of pediatrician Erika von Mutius. She treats allergies and Super. asthma, conditions in which the immune system overreacts to harmless substances. Rates of both disorders are on the rise in affluent, industrialized regions. Perhaps children are growing up in surroundings too germ-free for their own good. Microbes do a lot of harmful things to us, but they may also be important for our immune system to learn how to deal with the environment and how to tolerate and fight viruses, bacteria, and infections. To understand the causes of allergies and asthma, von Motius is conducting research in a place where these conditions are rare. The Bavarian countryside. She wants to sort out exactly which environmental factors may be protecting children who grow up here. The study we're doing is in comparison within little villages. So we compare children who live on the farm to children in the same village who do not live on the farm. She has enlisted over 800 families with children between the ages of 6 and 12 to participate in a detailed survey of health and lifestyle. In this questionnaire, we asked for allergic conditions, and then most importantly, we asked for the contact to farm animals and farming activities. Her goal is to create a profile of environmental exposures for each child. Her team analyzes dust samples from carpets and bedding throughout the house for the presence of animal hair, dust mites, and microorganisms. If the family keeps livestock, samples from the stables are screened for microbes released in the shedding and droppings of animals. The study is in progress, but preliminary results suggest one very strong correlation. One of the factors that seems to be important is the contact to the livestock. That these children, the more they are in the stables um, and the earlier they are in the stables, that this gives a protection against the development of allergies. High levels of microorganisms in the stables may help prime a child's immune system for life. Microbes have been around us always, and probably we need to find the balance between eradicating the harmful effect of bacteria and maybe also taking the beneficial components of this. But this is really into the future. Our species evolved in a world awash with microbes crowded with other creatures. We've only begun to understand the value of this heritage. Scientists and medical researchers who focus on the subject are more and more in agreement that it's a big mistake for humanity to separate itself from uh, the rest of the living world too much. The vast majority of species out there are our friends. They're not our enemies. And we not only benefit from them, but as a whole, they are essential to our existence. We're the fortunate heirs of more than three billion years of evolution that created this stupendous diversity. 
we need to learn a lot more about the living world and the way that humanity itself is affecting evolution. Like all living things, humans are a product of evolution. But we are the only species that knows it. We alone can see into the distant past and marvel at the history of life. We alone are beginning to understand that we can use evolution to shape the future for all of life. More than anything else, this unique vision may be what makes us human. Evolution website. Visit www.pbs.org. The seven part evolution box set and the companion book are available from WGBH Boston Video. To place an order, please call 1 800 255 9424.